So we ended up not having a place to live and also not owning anything, which is a rough way to start your life as a young person. You know? Like, Where do you go from there? The day that I had my son was the day when I realized I'm sewing into the future. It's like you, your brain just wakes up. You can't teach your kids something that you haven't mastered because that's hypocritical and they pick it up. I know because I picked it up with my dad had this saying, don't do as I as I do, do as I say. Good afternoon there, Anne-Marie Smuts. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thanks for having me, Gareth. It's awesome to meet you face to face, finally. Yeah, tell me about it. I, I think we've been trying to organize this for oh, six months, eight months, something like that. 100% my fault. No, not at all. Like, I mean, I've been super crazy busy on this side as well. And it's just the it's the way things are sometimes, you know, but uh, it's super cool that we, we managed to do it. And we've got our, our partners kind of like looking after our, our kids, our little ones for us for, for this moment. So um, we, we took some, some good planning. So, so thanks a lot for making the time. I was wondering, like, what is it like today in sunny South Africa? Today you have sunny South Africa. Are you talking about the weather or the vibe? Just the vibe because or whatever. We just whatever, had an yeah. election. Yeah, everything. The vibe is completely normal outside of social media. <laughs> so you have people who are complaining a lot online about the minister of this and the minister of that and what happened politically. But then you go to the shops and everything is perfectly fine. I think that's such a good lesson because my friend and I, uh, he's an American guy, he lives here in Brazil and we, we chat about this quite a bit because you know, we, we get a little bit wound up about some of the things online and, you know, he goes to America quite a bit and he's like, to be honest with you, when I get there, it's like, it's like awesome. And you know, all this, it's just not, it's not reality. And I think this is a, a really important thing that online is, is totally not what the collective is necessarily thinking. You obviously, you, you're often seeing the extremes on either side uh, online and often on purpose often the the algorithms want you to see things that are going to actually wind you up totally I, I was watching some interesting video the other day this girl posted i think she was like looking at uh, instagram or i think it was instagram i her, saw that did you see that one her and her boyfriend were sitting right next to each other and they were seeing completely different comments under this video exactly that's the crazy thing about um social media that nobody realizes well some people do definitely the people that are creating the, the code for it, that it is pushing you in one direction based on your likes, you know, uh, or who knows, maybe sometimes they, they intentionally put the opposite in there just to wind you up. <laughs> I don't know. This is half the problem. They're not radicalizing people at all. You know, if you look at the news, people aren't burning down buildings because of it. So no harm done. No, we, we love it. I mean, they, they're just such nice people that run these businesses. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm very partial to Elon though. Yes, I must say I'm a big fan. It's, it's very interesting because, you know, you have like people that are like, they call themselves, I don't know, awake or whatever. And then like, they're like, oh no, you can't trust Elon because he's this and that. And it's like, well, in, in your, you know, if I have to listen to you, like I can't trust anybody, you know what I mean? Like you, you take a guy like David Icke, I mean, he's said some really cool things over the years and like, I think woken a lot of people up and written some good books, but that bloke so far, I think he's so far gone now that he can't trust anybody. It, and it's so crazy. What a way to live. Yeah, I know. Like, I mean, imagine his nervous system. He's like tense the whole time. Must be terrible. Imagine his family conversations. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, for sure. But um, but yeah, we've got to be very careful of that. I think you know, like if you you're going down this sort of like I want to know the truth sort of route, you you can also always go too far. Yeah, there's a specific type of person that can stand outside of the information, and people get very angry with me when I can look at both sides of the argument and say so like, well. Everybody's missing the truth because you have to look at the facts. The man walked down the road and everyone's like, yeah, but he was wearing this shirt. And he was saying like, yeah, but the fact is he did this. And nobody seems to want to just look at the facts anymore. Like even that just offends everybody. We're living through a very uh, weird time at the moment where the truth, the truth definitely hurts. Um, some people don't want to know the truth. 
Uh, and um, yeah, the truth winds people up as well. And it's uh, and and it's weird how people don't want to uh, sort of engage in uh, debates as well. You know, it's like it's so cultish the the vibe that we seem to live in that um, that it doesn't really do us any good if we if we're going to sort of carry on that way. You know, yesterday I went for coffee at a friend's house, and she has a son who's twenty years old, and I can't remember how we came on the topic but he wanted to talk about abortion it's a heavy topic right but because I've had some conversations of it on it online already I I know what the discussions are around it and the very first thing he said to me was I know I'm a man so I'm not allowed really to have opinions about abortion so I said wait wait buddy you are allowed to have an opinion about it you're allowed to discuss it you're allowed to talk about it and you're allowed to now discuss it with me. What do you want to know? So we sat there and we had this conversation without arguing. And afterwards, you know, he he obviously had these questions, but he was never allowed to ask them. He had never had his, his questions answered, you know, the heavy hitting questions like, yeah, but in which case do you think it would be allowed, you know, morally, you know, if there was a rape that happened or something. And so we were able to discuss it. And afterwards he said to me like, wow, you didn't get angry with me. <laughs> well, no. How else are you going to know if you're never allowed to really discuss it with anyone? And I've found over the years, there are a lot of things that personally I would love to voice, especially regarding racism. But because of where I'm sitting, there is a bit of a weird relationship that you have with people, especially in South Africa. I don't know if you've ever being in it have you ever had a conversation with someone about r- racism and exactly what you think is racist and not racist I've never heard that conversation with anybody and it kind of is something that's burning inside me <laughs> where you I've I think I've been conditioned to not be allowed to speak about it in South Africa it's definitely a taboo subject and yeah. it's a tough one to talk about I think especially if you are talking about it with maybe someone who's you know not the same race as you that makes it much more challenging um i think people are defensive maybe i don't know quite rightly so you know i've haven't lived in a lot of people's shoes in south africa that have grown up say differently to how we might have grown up so their view is and their experience is very different and uh we can't necessarily judge, but we can listen and we can try and understand. And I think like mm. that's all you can really do a lot of the time in these sort of discussions is you can only really listen. You're not there to try and convince anybody, but if you can do it like in a, a nice enough manner that both parties feel like they heard uh, and understood, then I think you, you're winning, you know, like you had that, that that discussion yesterday like that's the result you want have you ever had a conversation like that not about racism really um that i can think of off the top of my head well, not even racism what i actually meant to say and i think racism is just that what came out because it's not generally the two ideas are so tied together but like you said your lived experience versus my lived experience because i know that there I've been called all sorts of names and people think that I grew, grew up a specific way. They they believe it. And nothing that I'm going to say is going to really convince them otherwise and unless they come sit down and say, ask me, come show me where you, where you grew up. Um, there's a lot that like, when you said that you did some research on me but you couldn't really find a lot. There's a lot that I could tell you. Um, I grew up close to Lanseria Airport. There was a little farm school. Okay, oh, did cool. you also grow up there? Well, I, I grew up in four ways, but I worked in Lanseria actually at the home of the chicken pie my whole high school career. So <laughs> I know the home of the chicken pie. Yeah. I've known so many people that got sick from those pies. Oh, have you? <laughs> oh, classic. <laughs> that is a landmark. Yes, we grew up in a small holding. My dad is an advocate, extremely accomplished man. He was one of the very first um, advocates that got to study at the Rand University at um, Rao when they started their law campus there. 
and he was extremely young um, when he qualified and he worked at the high court and he had this massive office. He had his own library. Um, we uh, lived on a, on a small holding. Um, life was really good. But when I was five years old, um, because it's a little bit out of the city and he worked in town, uh, he drove far every single day to work and back. Um, he had this old Mercedes and there was a head-on collision on one of the dirt roads. Three, uh, one of the women I remember was a pregnant woman and another man and my dad. And um, as far as I know, all of all three of them survived, but my dad actually ended up getting severe brain damage. But nobody knew. So over the years, I was five years old. I remember my dad coming home bloodied and a glass in his in his face. And slowly over the years, he, you know, he left um, his practice and he went into business, but life was never the same. We, we lost our farm, moved into a house that I loved. Eventually, we lost the house, and our houses just became smaller and smaller, um, just as my dad became sicker and sicker. So eventually, he couldn't earn any money. My mom was a, was a housewife, so she wasn't qualified in anything. She's a, she paints, but uh, without an income, we had to try and get to specialist to see why my dad was so ill. Turns out he had something called Kursikoff syndrome, which is a type of dementia um, that is actually brought on through a brain trauma. But because of the confusion, my dad also started drinking a lot and the empty calories from the alcohol caused the brain damage to, to then turn into this Kursikoff syndrome. I'm not 100% sure in exactly how it works. But um, he was unable to work. We eventually had to put him in a home. So I ended up living in the backyard of a church in a little in a little back room. All of our belongings were stored on a friend of my dad's farm. And I remember how old was I at the time? We lived in a few backyards. The first backyard we lived in, I was 10. All our belongings were stored, and I remember I wanted to go, we wanted to go fetch some things and our belongings were treated so disrespectfully that I was, we walked into this warehouse and the boxes had been torn open and just <laughs> ransacked. And my little toys and my little Barbie dolls and things, I had to, I, I was pulling them out of the mud as people had just walked over going through our stuff. Um, from there, we managed to, get things back together a little bit, bought a house, lived there for a while, again, lost the house, moved back into, that's when we lived in the back of a, of a church who looked up after us very, very nicely. But at that point, I was um, just finishing the trick and working in Roxy's, at Roxy's Rhythm Bar. At Melville. Bar Lady there. Yeah, Melville. Living my best life, you know, everybody wants to go to Roxy's then. It was yeah, the place to be. It was. <laughs> and our belongings were again stored in a, in a in a room that was broken into ransacked. Every little painting we had was was damaged. Every tea set, like every little thing that was that, that was important to us was either broken or stolen. So we ended up not having a place to live and also not owning anything, which is a, a rough way to start your life as a young person. You know, like where do you go from there? Yeah, let's go to London. Let's go work in work in London. It's like, ah, oh, I don't really, I can't afford to go to go over. Don't know anyone there. Didn't really have the confidence to go when all my friends went. So I kind of stayed behind. Um, it's at that point where I enrolled to go and study music at Pretoria Technicon, which is not TUT, but I also didn't finish. I did two years. Of a jazz, of a jazz degree, um, yeah. But I'm going to stop there and see if you want to interject with anything. A few things there. I mean, yeah, like you. I think what sort of started that off is is people don't realize, like, I guess the upbringing that you had, and they they paint a particular picture because they see you now, you know. So they have no idea of the struggle that you had as a youngster, and I think this has actually been one of the most 
important and one of the biggest lessons for me doing the podcast um, because I've had, had some, some of my good mates on the podcast and uh, I realized that I didn't really know my friend's stories, you know, and I, I also think that a lot of people go through life like that. You don't necessarily know your friend's stories at all. Most people go through life like that. That's what I mean. Yeah. And like, you know, like I've had lots of other friends that I've been to school with uh, since then. And now, now I know I'm a much better uh, sort of questioner and listener. And, and I, I ask deeper questions because I'm interested in people and their stories now. And, like, and I've spoken to some of my buddies that I went to school with and I'm like, what? You know, like, like the things that they were going through. Uh, while we were all at school and you had no idea because you were just like you were at school you're kind of having a good time you're playing sport together and um but you didn't know oh this oak was getting clapped by his mother or you know his dad was boozing every single night and he had no relationship with his dad or mm. you know other mates they grew up in Mauritius and they and, and they're like what I didn't even know you know what I mean just like like n yeah. n not all terrible stories but a lot of the time there, there's a lot of struggle that, that people don't realize and this is this is something that we actually all need to um, be conscious of uh, with, with everyone, you know, it's like you're seeing just the, the sort of tip of the iceberg, but you need to try and understand a little bit more about what's going on un underneath there. And I know just for myself, I really actually want to talk about my story, but nobody asks me, nobody comes and sits with me and, you know, asks me about what, what things were like when I were in school. Um, I'm like, well, I failed because we couldn't afford the the books. So I didn't have books to to study out of. Wow. Or everybody only I was incredibly rebellious. I was so rebellious and I had the dirtiest mouth. And it was actually a really I was hurting so much. And it came out as just this massive party girl that would do exact, you know, just what she wanted. Um, when I, in fact I, I was yearning for for boundaries and heavier parenting, you know, that I didn't receive at that time because I was my you know. now that I'm older, it is strange that I, I can I'm probably the age now that my mom was when these bad things were happening. And often I stop and I think like, how would I feel if my husband was in a, a car accident? And he had brain damage and I had him at home and I had four children to look after. Like, yeah, and it, it hits me so hard. Um, I don't, yeah, my friends didn't have a clue really what I was, what I was going through. They just, maybe they, didn't, they knew something wasn't right. I'm also trying to think back of the friends that I had in school and we were so clueless. We really need to, to raise our kids to be a little bit more smarter than we were because i mean we spoke about it i think it's difficult when you when you you know hindsight is great you know you you looking back now you are you I mean you're a totally different person and you you're much wiser and your your experience is is very different you you've changed a lot as a person too you, now you're much more stable etc so you know looking back you you're going to be questioning things and you're going to be saying oh yeah i know we were clueless and stuff but actually maybe you were just uh living life to the best that you knew at the time, you know, and you're also a kid and, and, and sometimes you're a kid and that's really how you should live. You know, you shouldn't have to, you should just be really having fun. You know, as a kid, you don't necessarily <laughs> need to be asking your friends kind of sometimes, you know, what's up here and there. Cause that, that's, that, that's almost up to the parents to provide that sort of stability and those sort of conversations. Um, and, and I think we we only maybe mature enough when we get a bit older to, to try and understand this better. I look at my sister and my brother. They have kids that are now going into high school, almost finishing high school. And when I have conversations with them, they're so much wiser than I was. So much wiser. They're really doing it right. Those kids are so well balanced. The way that they think and the way that they reason, the way that they understand the world is. But I also think, you know, that now, it is an absolute necessity to understand what kids are facing and what's being taught in our schools, what's being, you know, what the government is teaching, wants the, you know, the curriculums to be at school, what's happening online, that parents have, they were forced to wake up 
I don't know how awake our parents were when we kind of also already had cell phones at school. We already had, you know, there was pornography going around. There were these social ills that affect children today it was kind of already happening when we were in school but it was a little bit more we could hide it better look it's very difficult now i think i mean the access to information is you know it's yeah. just everywhere and uh you have to as a parent i think like you said be well aware of what is out there uh, you you do have to have a certain amount of sort of filtering and control over what your your kids are consuming but you also need to I think remember as as a as a parent that actually the education really should start with you, you know. School in my opinion is like it's a cool place to go and hang out, you know, and it's a sometimes a bit of a supplementary thing to what you should actually be teaching your kids about life and and these sort of things. Uh but obviously, I mean, you know, that the society doesn't necessarily allow that because parents are both working, parents are super stressed out, there's other issues going on. So Yeah. we have a lot of uh i think uh looking inside to do almost as a society okay cool we we've stuffed up a bit let's um let's try roll things back a little bit or, or, or be better and and that's the responsibility of people like you and me that are now parents you know and we're like okay cool well, we're not going to we're going to do things a, bit, a little bit differently and uh try and make uh you know the future society just just as, as as best as we can i think i also f fell into the trap when i was a lot younger you know the the liberal liberal mindsets of why have children don't bring kids into this world you know but i'm so glad that i that i woke up from that because the day that i had my son was the day when i realized i'm sowing into the future that's like you your brain just wakes up all of a sudden everything's dangerous <laughs> but you you now realize he's either going to be a leader or a follower there's nothing in between and you're going to have to choose for him he's you're either going to raise raise him to lead other people into into truth or he's just going to follow whatever he believes he believes the truth and there's no passivity there like you can't it's not a passive activity how do you do that uh For your son. Like he's six now. Recently, he started uh, talking to me about ghosts. And I was trying to figure out where did he come on that topic because he's in a very extremely conservative little um clitor school. You know, it's a an old school nursery school where there's no organic food and stuff there. It is just like the way that we had it. And I I chose it like that on purpose. You know, they they play the whole day it's an amazing little school but i know that it didn't happen there so it happened in my house um so i realized that even the little stories that i allow him to watch there's still some stuff in there although i can't go and sit and watch every little thing with him because i mean i'm also around the house i have a little 18 18 month old um so i'm, I'm distracted and doing other stuff so Like even in my house, what he sees, um, but just to be on it immediately. Like if I hear it coming out of his mouth, like maybe I, I'm a little bit too much, but I have to find exactly where that came from and to make sure that I that I can eliminate and steer and steer him away. How do you do that? Do you ask him questions or what's your sort of approach? Yeah, it's a difficult one because my son, um, he has apraxia. And so he has a, a speech delay. So apraxia kids, there's also a different, another word. Oh, I can't remember now exactly what it was, but he received a, a diagnosis with a, another name, which may, basically means that their language builds in, in blocks, not in words, but in full sentences and, and thoughts. So he speaks a lot in what he sees on the television. That builds his language. To understand exactly where something come from, comes from takes a lot of sifting information and trying to find something. Um, so it's, it's a massive challenge, you know, his, his speech. Um, but just keeping a, an extremely close relationship with him. 
you know. So like um, never punishing him for something that he comes to tell me is one, one, one approach. You know, I'm always available. He can say whatever he wants to me. Obviously, you know, he has come, come home with some swear words from school with other, other friends. But, but, even in, but even in that, you know, um, correcting him, trying to help him understand what's right and wrong and what's acceptable in our house, this is still a learning journey for me. I know that the place where I want to be is to never have anything sever my relationship with my son, to never have anything come in between. Um, and at the moment, the, I think the thing that breaks relationships um, the quickest I thought my, my pregnancy with my with my baby girl was really hard. It was a very difficult pregnancy. And I had undiagnosed post, postpartum depression while I was pregnant. And a lot of people don't know that you can actually have that. I has happened to come across um, a preacher talking about it on, on Instagram, uh, a female preacher, and she was talking about her own experience with it. Oh my gosh, I just I can relate, but it makes your fuse extremely short. Having a short fuse and being busy with stuff around the house, and especially a person who, like me who might be very particular about it, the way that I want things. I like a clean house. I, don't, I like you know dinner be, to be on time. I like bedtimes to be on time. I like things to be like this. Um, the kid can fall through that crack. It makes a, a crack very quickly. And I've had to apologize to him a lot, but to learn how to self-correct so that I can mend my relationship with him very quickly. And Sham, they're so sweet when it comes to when it comes to that, because their desire is always to 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 please you. Like I flip, I just I can't stand it when people, when grown-ups hurt kids. Because they always just want to please. Yeah, you, you've probably seen with your little girl as well. You know, they always want to please Papa. And they always want to, want to do what makes you happy. So to have a short fuse with them or to be harsh with them, um, especially with ideas that you don't agree with. And it doesn't matter what age they are. You know, I mean, like, I just think about American politics. How many families have shattered because of the the president that you support, right? Stupid, eh? Yeah. People allow that to create short fuses in their relationships with their, with their children and with their, with their family. And they, they, they sever those very delicate relationship, relational bands with their, with their kids. But I'm not willing to do that. So the plan is to work on myself <laughs> so that I can parent him well and to decide on what the boundaries are for our household and to firstly model to him how we don't cross those boundaries and what you do when somebody crosses those boundaries because somebody will. It's very good advice. I think the one of the really cool things that you said now is like you you have to work on yourself and that's what a lot of people don't actually realize, especially when it comes to parenting, is that your kid is going to expose a lot of your sort of triggers. Oh, boy. <laughs> Daily. A lot of your insecurities and also a lot of your shadows. And oh, yeah. I read this amazing book called The Conscious Parent uh, by Dr. Shafali Tarberry, a really amazing woman. And um, her overarching message is that your kid is going to teach you more uh, then you will be able to ever teach your kid. Uh, and I thought it was a really interesting one because effectively like the, the best personal growth you could ever do is to, is to have a child uh, because they are going to literally make you grow up very quickly, but they're also going to expose all your kind of warts and all. And um, it's up to you to sort those out so that you don't pass that on to your child. And um, it was really, really fascinating book. And so, so, you know, but and people don't like actually taking responsibility for their own faults. They're like, no, I'm right. It's you know, what are you talking about? I'm parents, you know. And and actually, it's often not what the case is. You really need to be aware of uh, you know what your kid is 
uh, saying to you, uh, how they are triggering you, et cetera, et cetera, to go, Ooh, okay. There's something there. I need to, I need to sort, sort something out myself before you react and go down <laughs> the wrong path. No, definitely. You know, if just come back to Elon Musk, we spoke about him earlier. He's got 12 kids now, I believe. He's a, he's a, um, likes to, yeah, he wants to populate the earth um, as we're all called to do. But I think he understands what having children means for society and that there are a lot of people, especially now, I mean, just it's going to, it's crude to say it, but it is, it's a crude topic. You know, there are so many women walking around having had multiple abortions and wondering why their lives are just not, they, they're never going to reach the pinnacle of their potential. Never. It's not going to happen for them. They could have had it, and every single one of those babies was the stepping stone to, to them being a better person, a more accomplished person, a stronger, a stronger leader. Like you said, you know, all those shadows, all of that, we're all filled with evil stuff. It's in there, you know. C- taxi cuts you off. You know what's in your heart. <laughs> 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 you know, everybody has a little bit of road rage in them, some more than others. But learning, like you can't teach your kids something that you haven't mastered because that's hypocritical and they pick it up. I know because I picked it up with my dad had this saying, don't do as I, as I do, do as I say. That didn't work. Yeah. It didn't work because, I, you know, kids model their parents. So I know if there's something that my kid is doing that I don't like, I have to look at me first and I have to decide how, how am I going to model to him to do it better. And once they be- – you only have the one. Yes. And you have the little girl. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You're going to see, it is crazy how quickly they start policing you and it's infuriating. She's doing it already. You don't worry about that. <laughs> My son, when he's housing, he's like, mommy, go say sorry to daddy. He's like, oh, gosh, oh, why did my kid have to tell me that? Like, I'm so sorry. And you feel like a failed parent. But then you look at them and then you're just like, okay, you feel really sheepish. You go say sorry. And then you've modeled to them. They're very happy. They feel secure and they go on and they play and they do their thing. You know, but next time you have that thing in the back of your mind, and you're like, okay, well, I'm going to have to start modeling better behavior. I don't know if you had the, have the same experience or if it's just me, but I'm still very much a kid. I don't feel like a grown up. And often I'm surprised at how God is entrusting two kids to me <laughs> because I still on my inside feel like how are there people my age in such like in massive leadership positions and they're overseeing corporations or you have them in politics or and that people they carry so much responsibility and I'm just like I've got the responsibility of, of my of my two kids, you know, and I just I'm amazed that that we can be entrusted with the lives of 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 you know precious children. It almost feels like it shouldn't be allowed. I think that there's there's two separate things there. Like I think as a person, you probably always feel kind of young at heart. Maybe not everybody, but I think a lot of people do. You know, you 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 actually feel young at heart, and you you kind of like. You you're always just going through life like feeling okay cool I'm I'm having fun is this like reality, um, and that's just one aspect of it. That doesn't mean that you're you're not responsible or caring or anything like that. I think those are two kind of distinct things. So I'm the same. I definitely feel like I'm still a kid. I keep asking myself like, when does life actually get like? serious you know like isn't there a point where you feel like okay cool well now now it's serious you know i've got i've got a, a kid and i'm responsible and totally I, I feel that but i still don't feel like life is necessarily like 
serious, you know. <laughs> um, um, but that doesn't stop me from trying to be the best father, best person, responsible, like be a good guide, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's quite a cool thing of how we are just wired as, as humans that we we have that feeling of like almost eternal childlikeness. So maybe it's just something we need to we need to be grateful for. I definitely know for myself it's something that I'm going to, and I need to cultivate more because my children enjoy it. They enjoy that side of me a lot. But then you have the flip side of it where if I don't watch myself, I can go down a rabbit hole of fear very quickly, like in an instant. I spent way too much time on Twitter. You know it. You've seen me there. I know it. My husband knows it. <laughs> it is a place where fear breeds because you see the absolute worst of humanity right here in your house. The person who says the most vile, racist, sexist, pedophilic thing is right here in your house on your phone. And it's gone into my eyes, it's gone into my brain. And I wasn't careful. There's this little song that goes, careful little ears, what you hear. Careful little eyes, what you see. Because it, it creates fear on your inside. All of a sudden, like I, my sister passed away recently, about four years ago um, in Tanzania. She was just about finishing her contract. She was going to start her dream job um, at the African Union. And she was going to move to Ethiopia from Tanzania. Everything, her bags were packed. She was ready to come back. And she contracted malaria. And they found her in her flat, passed out three days later. She passed away in the hospital in Dar es Salaam. Just like that, this light of my life was taken away from me. And I was like, she's not going to see my children grow up. This person... That was my keeper. Like my sister, we would fight like <laughs> mad, like crazy. But it's because she knew my personality is all over the place. I'm it's such a dreamer. And she was always pulling me back to reality. And all of a sudden, I didn't have that. Can you just remind me what we were talking about? Because I completely went off on a tangent now. I had a point. You were... Oh, the fear. Uh, yes, talking about fear, yeah. Sorry, so the fear, going through, through, through that, burying my sister, sent me, at that stage, my son was just under two years old. I wouldn't leave the house. I didn't leave the house for months. I wouldn't get in a car and drive. I missed out on so many opportunities. I mean, at that, that point, um. A, fr a very good friend of mine, Karine Duval, she contacted me about a songwriting retreat that she was, um, it's like a secret retreat on a wine farm, all expenses paid. It was the best opportunity that I had ever received in my life. And I contemplated not going because I didn't want to get in my car and drive to Friendship because I was afraid of what was going to happen to me because all of a sudden the reality hit home that we are going to die and you can die today. And still even saying it, it's like, oh, no, man, maybe, maybe like some other day. It's not going to be today. It's not going to be today. It could be today. It's like I struggle to claw my way out of that hole. And it's almost as if there's this massive hole that opened up when she died that it's kind of sitting there dormant. And if I feed that thing, it takes over my whole life. If I turn my back on it, it's something that was never there before. But now it's like this ever-present, it's almost like a tornado. You know, if I'm going to feed it something, it gets stronger. And if I starve it, it gets smaller. But it's never, it's, I don't think it'll ever go away. And it's hard when you have kids because now I can pass that fear on to them because it's something that you can take and you can literally give it to somebody else. 
And that is really the position that we put ourselves in when we are incessantly on social media around people that peddle in fear. That's what they do. It's like something happened to them and this fear happened. Now they have this tornado going, going. There's nothing that they can do about it. Well, except that they can stop feeding it. But the media makes money or feeding everybody's little tornado. And that is what they do every single day. Their headlines are curated specifically to feed your little fear tornado. There's a few things in there which uh, are very important for people to be aware. Firstly, I'm, I'm really sorry to, to hear about your sister and I can only imagine how oh, thank you. empty that must make you feel and just how devastating it was not knowing, you know, and just knowing how she passed away like, by herself from malaria. So um, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, the, 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 so uh, t firstly, talking about fear, there's a really amazing woman. Her name is Teal Swan. Uh, like, I really like listening to her sort of outlook on life and especially relationships. And one of the things that she speaks about uh, is fear. And she says, the number one thing that men don't understand about women is the fear that they live in, right? And um, it's just like, it's just how, you know, the, the feminine sort of energy is wired, I guess. And as a man that where men are generally more masculine energies, we don't necessarily understand that. Um, and this can cause a lot of conflict in relationships because you know, there's uh, there's great memes where you see like a dad like throwing his kid up in the air and it's like one meter. And then it's the, the next part of the meme is like, this is what mom sees. And it's like 20 meters in the air, you know, <laughs> and that kind of, no, exactly. that's kind of a nice way of explaining the fear, but obviously it's, it's at a deeper level too, you know, women are generally, I guess, more fearful maybe about like what could happen to them. Um, you know, just because you're, you're a girl, like, you know, something can happen to you because a guy can attack you sort of thing. So it's a very different uh, way of living. And, and as men, we need to realize this and we need to offer that sort of protection and, and comfort for our, our other halves and, and also not get like wound up ourselves when we see them, you know, in our opinion, like, what are you worrying about? You know, that's what, that's what, that's kind of our, our, our mind process. So yeah. that's, that's, that's some really interesting stuff that you say there, but the, the, the social media thing, I was having a chat to my friend the other day and uh, he's like, super positive, happy guy, but also very like, very anti-establishment, um, uh, sort of deep conspiracy. And I, I mean, most of them are not conspiracies anymore, but like that sort of, you know, way of, exactly. of sort of <laughs> like, he, he's always been that way. Um, and um, the other day he was like, I'm not, I'm really, I don't know what it is, but I'm not in a good place. And I was like, bud, I know what it is. I was like, you're spending way too much time researching things that actually you might think are good to know but they're actually not you can't do anything about them and um they're not serving you right and that's i think why you're feeling because you, you're getting triggered um you you probably upset and depressed that the world in, is, is a certain way it is like there's some sort of evil that that sort of uh governs it sometimes and i think that's what it is and, and he was like oh, i think it actually is too so we have to be so careful with uh, what we feed ourselves, you know, and and social media is the, is is the worst place to do that. You know what I mean? Like totally the worst place. I I yeah, have a, no, I have a, I have a question for you quickly because you know this is actually around social media and and your experience because you wrote something which which feeds which, which which sort of is a nice part of this conversation here that we that we um, sort of can go into. You said. Not so subtle jabs I've received from women. Your sister is so beautiful. You two don't look anything alike. Your hair is your best feature. Beautiful photo of you doesn't really look like you. If you, insert body part, wasn't so insert shape, you'd be really beautiful. Your most recent, oh, and most recently, your skin looks so beautiful. Why did you do, or what did you do because you normally look so tired? So, <laughs> this is the real nasty side of, of social media. Like, how do you, how do you? That was not that? on social media. That was to my face. Gary. Wow. Okay. So that's that's just. I mean, that's terrible. 
People are assholes. What do I do when people are mean to me on social media? Yeah, or even in person, maybe, you know. Yeah, both of them. Oh, I like to think that I'm a I'm a tough cookie, but I'm actually I have a, a very soft center. <laughs> a lot softer than I, I'd like to admit. I just wanted to get back to what you were talking about social media and um but your your friends' experience. And it the kind of ties it it all ties together is that I've come to the conclusion that our th- we think we have unlimited capacity. You just think, I'm going to read this today, and for the rest of the day, I, was, I will still have enough capacity. But we actually don't. We have limited capacity. For each day, you have a limited capacity. and. Just say that it's like a glass of water. If you pour too much water in it, it's going to flow over. That glass can only hold that amount of water. If you take that Vista sauce or, a, or some mustard or something, and you just put a little, little drop inside of that water, it muddles all of it. I hate to admit it because... Now that I'm saying it out loud, people are going to hear it and they're going to come at me on social media and say nasty things to me because they're going to know that it actually affects me. <laughs> but you, nobody is unaffected by the stuff that people say to them, say to them and the, the things that people do. And the worst thing is anybody, any loser in their mom's basement can give you, can send you an insult right into your bedroom into your heart just like that I've done it to people oh my gosh I've shot some arrows some some comebacks at people and it's like and you know I know because I you know if a woman knows how a, a man's ego works she knows just what to say to afflict to you know to afflict maximum damage and it's like let me say that thing that's gonna crush you and you're never gonna get up <laughs> you know, because you did insult me on my social media page. How dare you, scoundrel? <laughs> but that thing is like a drop of mud in my clean water for the day. And my children have to drink from that water. My whole family drinks from that capacity that I have for the day. And the worst that I've felt was that my energy was completely sapped and muddled by rolling in the mud with inter- internet strangers about stupid political garbage. And we all do it day in. Maybe you don't do it as much. Some people are a little bit wiser than me. But sometimes I forget that I'm actually on, I don't really spend time on any other social media. So if I say social media, I'm talking about Twitter, about X. Um, because that's where I spend my my days, you know. I mean, I've been home raising my kids now for six years, and I always had this idea: I'm going to read books and I'm going to be super productive. But it's just not how it works. They keep you damn busy. I run after them every single moment, or every single day. It never stops. You don't get a chance to even drink your hot coffee, and you want to connect with people. You know, you don't always have. When my son was was a baby, I had five other friends who had kids or little babies at the same time. So we had a little mom's club and we'd go for coffees and mug and bean and sit there for three or four hours and just have bad conversations. But all of them moved away. And now when I had my baby, I was alone. And it's a very, very lonely place. It's extremely lonely. So, you know, I have my my friends that I made online and you have your conversations checking in and I read it. I use X as my news source. Um, so I don't have other newspapers and things that I read. You know, I'll scroll through my feed. Um, and let me just get back to my, to my point now. The problem with using X as my news feed is that it comes with comments and opinions from everybody else in all these different countries and one of the massive problems that people never ever address is like we had this conversation just before we started you and I about how different things are in Brazil 
and how people have different customs in different countries. You know, the way that that I speak to someone is sometimes they find it extremely direct. Other people don't find it direct at all. So you have people with, they grew up diff- speaking different ways. Some people are super disrespectful, but in their culture, it's fine. But you speak to another person in a, com- in a completely different culture and it like insults their forefathers. <laughs> The way that you're speaking to them. <laughs> and nobody cares. It's just this free fall. And at the end of the night, well, at the end of the day, it really is up to me. And I, I'm, you know, I'm saying it now because it's something that's actually, I need to start taking it a lot more responsibility for it. Is if, and we spoke about it earlier. If I want to police what my child watches on television, right? Am I policing myself? How big, how much am I controlling what goes into my eyes when I'm scrolling social media? Because it's impossible to control. I've, I've, I've changed my setting of the videos to not autoplay. That's something that I did very early on because. There were videos of people being burnt alive and you're just like, I didn't want to see it. And now it's, it's in me. <laughs> and you, getting that washed out. You now, if you take a glass of water and you, you, you dunk the, the bit of mustard in there and you give it a stir, how much water do you have to, so you open a faucet or like a tap and the water runs out of it into the glass, clear water. It has to run for a while before all of that muck is washed out. What is the clear water that actually runs into you? I really like that analogy. It's a, it's a great one and it's, um, it's a lot to think about as well because it is easy to be uh, told something online and it to impact your whole day. You know, uh, many people are not conditioned enough to deal with a lot of the the sort of things and handle negative stuff. Uh, So you you, you have to have a game plan, I think, as well uh, in terms of um, social media. And and I I, like, I think early on I realized, okay, cool. Well, I know that this is going to be, you're going to read stuff that you're not going to agree with. You're going to, people are going to wind you up and whatever. And you just got to go, okay, cool. It's water for ducks back. That's kind of my approach. I'm like, okay, cool, whatever. I'm not going to get wound up. I'm not going to let this stuff affect me emotionally, et cetera, et cetera. And that's almost the way you have to do it because otherwise you can you can really just like, I don't know, get depressed and have terrible days and, and all these sort of things. So um, a strategy is important, I think. And um, yeah, not, not just limiting realizing. Your time. Yeah, you're wasting your time. Exactly, exactly. So you have to limit your time and how you how much time you spend online definitely i'm really interested in people that sort of reinvent themselves i know you said that you studied um jazz uh, for for a couple of years uh, and now you are a, a singer how did you sort of uh transition from i think you i think you worked a little bit in, in the corporate world and then now you're solely focusing on on being a singer like what was that transition like for you? The transition is currently still happening. Um, when I finished school and I went to go study music, it didn't work out exactly the way that I had kind of hoped because I I had a scholarship that I messed up and I had a NISFAS loan that I that I need to need to apply for that was rejected. So I couldn't finish what I started. Um and I Honestly, I wasn't really doing well. I wasn't thriving where I was. So my brother, a wonderful person that he is, he sent me to go do a course in IT, um, a SAP certification, and I knew nothing about it. I had zero IT background, and I found myself sitting in this course not knowing what, what was going on, and everybody else knew <laughs> that I didn't know what was going on. Um, Funny story. It wasn't funny at the time, but it's funny now. Um, maybe it's still not funny. <laughs> a woman stood up in the class after I'd asked a question, looked right at me, full class, probably about 30, 40 people, 
you know, professional people from all over the, the country. And she stood up and she looked at me and she said to me, you don't belong here. You don't know anything. So I just sat there thinking, you know, I don't know anything, but that's kind of the point of me sitting here. If you know everything, why are you here? <laughs> but I wish I had said that, but um, and it it was it was hard, you know. I but I finished the course. Passed. I was one of maybe five percent of the, the, the of the class to actually pass the exam. And I finished, you know, and then I started a corporate career in in SAP, but also just kind of flailing around. Um, my personality is very frustrating where I'm a little bit too creative to be serious about something and I'm too serious to be completely creative. So it's these two wolves constantly going at each other. Um, but I did, you know, I did a few, few years there and then I, I started freelancing as a sub consultant, got into software testing. So I did, been, you know, did that for a good 15 years. And when my sister passed away and I got the chance to go, you know, immediately after I was invited by my, by my friend to go on the songwriting retreat, that is where the shift happened for me. Um, I never knew. Like, the music industry is a hard one, man. If, if someone doesn't tell you how to do it, it's almost impossible because you're always going to believe the idea of, Someone has to discover me. Nobody tells you that no one's going to discover you. It doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. It may be like 0 0.000001. 000 no, I already had a point in there. Percents of people get discovered. Now you can get discovered on TikTok, but still, it's such a tiny amount of people. So if you want to do it, how are you going to do it? It really helps when you know people. And I knew absolutely nobody. But at this retreat, all of a sudden, I found myself absolutely timid and heartbroken sitting at this table, struggling to get my words out. But I was surrounded by some of the best musicians in the country, producers that I would never have been, a, you know, have had the opportunity to, to meet. So I took the chance, opened my mouth, had the conversations, made friends, and I left there with friendships. So all of a sudden, I knew because somebody told me, you have to take money and pay a producer so that he will take your song and make something nice out of it. Then you sit with something that nobody's going to hear. So how are they going to hear it? In steps a radio plugger. You have to take money. Pay the radio plugger. He's going to take your song and then send it to radio stations with your photograph and your bio. And then they listen to it and then they decide are they going to put it on their playlist or not. Like, man, at that stage, I mean, I was in my 30s. I had no idea because nobody ever told me any of this. <laughs> and of course, I, I wish that I was much younger you know, starting in my early 20s or even before that, people get, um, it's easy for me to step in the trap of, yeah, but if somebody just helped me, then I would have been better. It's a place that I don't go. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm still in a position where I'm actually at home and my first responsibility is looking after my kids and looking after my home. And I never, ever, ever have a quiet, time, quiet moment to sit and write. I don't know if you've ever tried writing with writing anything profound with someone pulling on your arm. Like, I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> like, how am I going to write this song? Um, or I, my son went through this phase when I did have time, whenever I picked up my guitar to play, he would just start crying, like scream crying. I could never play my guitar. So I had to like sit and play really softly in the other room. Um, I did my vocal training in the car, in the garage, just so that nobody would have a conversation with me. And I'm severely introverted. So having people around me in the house, <laughs> when you're trying to do something really um, thoughtful, is incredibly hard. Um, so during lockdown happened, 
2020. So 2019, my sister passed away. I had the, and I went on the, the songwriting retreat. March of 2020 lockdown happened and we were at home. But at that stage, you could still kind of work from home. So I paid a babysitter to come and um, sit with my son for three hours a day. And that is when I, that was actually only later on. In the beginning, the bulk of the, the album, I decided I was going to record, write and record an album between 9 and 11 at night. I would sit very quietly in the dark in the front of the house, quiet, not to, not to wake, you know, I only had my son at the time. Um, because if he heard me play, then he wouldn't sleep. He'll come and want to, to come play with me. Um, so I sat in the dark and quietly started writing my songs and eventually I could pay someone to come and sit with my son, you know, babysit him while I could finish my songs during the day. Um, and it was the best experience. Oh my gosh, working with other musicians and producers who actually know what they're doing. You know, like I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I imagine if you write, when, if you ever get the opportunity to write a book, to give it to an editor and they just take what you have and they bring it to life and you still recognize it as yours but it just it has this this new vision to it it is the most magical experience and I remember getting my songs back and I would just go drive and just listen to my own music and it's like it's so cheesy but I love my own songs. I love it. I love it. Because previously I would, um, I had the chance to, to meet one of the best songwriters in the world. And my question to him was, how do you write songs that you like? Because I write a lot of songs and I don't really like them. It's like, why do you write songs and you like them, but I, and you like them, but I write songs and I don't really like them. And he just, you know, he was kind of in conversation with somebody else and he just said, you know, you just, you, you haven't written enough songs. And it's like, mm -hmm. how many are you supposed to write? And he's just like, write a hundred. I'm like, how am I going to write a hundred songs? But it's okay. I now I understand what he meant was you have to find your own way of getting where you want to be. Nobody else can do that for you. So I have a way that I write my songs where I decide where I want to be first. I want to get to that. It has to sound like this. It has to has, have that kind of vibe to it. And then I already know, oh, okay, if I don't go in that direction, I'm not going to like it. Cool. Tick. Um, geez, I realized that I'm not even answering your question. No, I'm enjoying your answer. It's a great answer. I love it. <laughs> I started um, transitioning from working in IT projects to then actually forking out money to produce music that don't really earn anything. So it's a net lose to make music. But I was able to, to tap into a creativity that brings life to me, that brings it's the essence of me that I, you know, it's almost like a little burning ember or a glowing ember on your, on your inside, that, that, that passion that you have for something. And it'll just stay on your inside until, the, until you die one day. It's never going to go away. You know, you, you can suppress it all you want, but if that is the thing that you're supposed to be doing with your life, it's a glowing ember that was implanted in you for a reason. I do go through periods where I need to ask for money online to make music. And it's not my favorite thing. I really don't like it. I think it's really cheesy to have a buy me a coffee on my, on my Twitter page. But it is because it, just, it, it takes so much financially for me to produce music. Um, and it's not something that I that I earn much from. So I'm not able to 
support my habit. Um, you know, if people like my music, they're going to have to support me financially to, um, to be able to do it. I was able to only release one track last year, write one song, and I decided I'm going to have that one produced. So I had it produced. It's now recently gone to radio. It's not my, it's not the dream I had. My, it looks a lot different, you know. When I was younger, I always I wanted to play really big stadiums. I still do. Um, it's not the reality for me to spend a lot of time on my music because right now music is not my number one priority. So even though I shifted from working corporate IT into music, it's still on the on the back burner. It's still something that I. I'm hoping to be able to do a little bit more, um, you know, write more in the future, produce more in the future. Um, you can hold me accountable if you see me really wasting my time on, 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 on X, having dumb conversations with people and just like, listen, Jack, you're supposed to be writing music or at least just focus on your music a little bit. <laughs> because that's the reason that is my entire reason for being on X is I know I want to gather people to get to know me as a person so that I can introduce my music to them that is the whole point cool I'm going to hold you to that and I'm going to I'm going to give you a bit of um a bit of feedback then if that's if, if you're open to that yeah do it do it I promise I won't get offended so I would say by looking at your your feed, it would be difficult to know that you're a singer uh, because most of the stuff that you actually talk about or you share is uh, is definitely political. Uh, so I would, you know, and I know maybe this is, maybe I'm not not uh, being kind. I'm trying to be kind, but, but I do think like uh, if, you want people to gravitate to to you to support you then the best thing that to do is to share your journey as a musician and even if that means okay cool today guys uh i'm gonna try write a song or i'm gonna try write a verse but i'm also a mom and that's my priority but i want to share this journey with you so this is what happened you know I started writing and then my son came and then he asked me a few questions and then I stopped, but then I came back. You know what I mean? Like, like just be real. Uh, I think the most important thing these days about being online is, is authenticity, uh, relatability. Uh, and that's what people, that's what they cling to. They want that. They actually want to be part of your journey. They want to be part of your success, you know, but if you're not actually sharing that, then they're not going to kind of maybe want to support you or, or be part of the journey. If they're only seeing like, say, political stuff, then it'd be like, well, who's this chick? <laughs> you know, like, what, what, what is she actually about? Yeah. Um, that would, that, I mean, I mean, I know it's maybe out of place to, to share advice, but I, I would think no, that's, that totally people would love, that they love, people love a good story. They love a comeback story. They love people that are in the corner that uh you know people that put mm. in a big effort that make act that take action and they want to be part of that and they want to support that like deep down i think humans really do actually want each other kind of to do well yeah you know what gareth thank you for this i am taking it and i'm gonna put it to practice you'll see um i think it's it's vital because it's not every day that you actually get feedback on how so, uh, how you are perceived. So it's very really important. Um, I think as a woman in the phase that I'm in right now, um, it is such a highly distractible uh, environment that you find yourself in. It's distractible, an English word. I don't think it is distracted. No, makes distractible makes sense, I think. <laughs> Just where you are actually, it is a struggle every day to 
plan your day because I'm planning the day of two other people. So I'm cutting two pairs of toenails before I get to my own toenails. I have to brush two sets of teeth before I brush my own teeth. So myself, you are so far behind in the queue that you don't ever do anything for yourself, really. It's not a fun place to be. Um, I think every single parent understands that, you know, you can't, you're not doing the things um, at the same speed that you were able to do them before or at the same veracity as, as before. I'd love to be able to just have three or four hours a day to really focus and say, okay, let me go and plan out what I want to put out there. And I did fall hook, line, and sinker. I did step into that trap of speaking my mind on random things. And because maybe I can blame the algorithm a little bit because my comments are going to be on what my eyes see, but it's reactive instead of being, what's the word? You know what I'm, the word that I'm looking for? Instead of being... Well, non-reactive, um, what's a better word for it? Well, if you're doing something on purpose. I'm just listening to you now, okay? So, so I think almost by the way you're speaking is you are not realizing the, the impact that you can have and the people that you can bring into your audience by simply sharing the challenge of trying to be a musician and trying to be a mom. Like if you just speak about the like your your day, like, okay, cool. Um uh yeah, here I am. I'm I'm trying to like uh, play the guitar, but my son is coming to me and or he's just screaming because he doesn't like the noise. Um, you're mm. gonna invite this whole group of moms into your world, right? And so so they might not be really interested in music, but they're gonna be interested in the mother side of things. So you're gonna you're gonna have this whole big sort of pot of people that you're going to bring in because of the story that you are saying. And, and, and another thing, which I think ties into that, the last bit you were saying is like, when we, to use social media wisely, I think is to uh, rather generate content than respond to things, especially things that trigger us or like that annoy us. Like, like, you know, so, so sometimes I think it's like, it's important to go, okay, am I, Am I responding to something that's not really going to make a big difference in my life or the world? Or am I putting out something that, uh, that is maybe someone's going to just see and they might not say anything, they might just like it and it might help them in some sort of way. But I always think putting information out rather than taking stuff in is, is a good way to help grow your audience, uh, but also to just to feel better about yourself. That's what really what it, a lot of it comes down to because at the end of the day, if you feel better about yourself, you're going to want to do better things. You're going to be a nicer person to be around. So, and, and I think the only way to not one of the only ways to do that is by taking action and, um, uh, yeah, by putting stuff out there and not being reactive to, to stuff. So, you know, just remind yourself every single day in the morning, go, okay, cool. Today's a day that I'm going to, um, put something out there. I'm not, and, and instead of, comment or instead of requoting or something like that. Like, I don't know, that just would be my, my thoughts. You know, I think like I look at you and I'm like, wow, do you even realize how talented you are? Do you, do you even realize like how good your voice is? Do you even realize how other people wish that they could sing like you? Do you, do you, do you even realize how other people wish they could play the guitar. Are, are you aware of the skills that you possess? Do you truly know, understand, you know, like how, like for me, for example, I wish I could pick up a guitar and I could strum a, a little tune, but I can't because I, I, not, I just don't, I'm, I'm not musically like talented, you know, I, I could probably learn it, but, and I have tried in the past, but it's, uh, yeah, I just, I just don't have that, you know? So 
use, you know, seriously, like you said, there's that fire inside of you. Keep that fire going. Realize the talents that you have and share it with the world. You know what I mean? I know one of your inspirations in music that you've written about is like to share, I guess, good vibes and, and light um, and uh, make that your sort of like daily mantra. Cool. Am I, you know, even if it's like I'm going to record a 15 second video playing the guitar as opposed to spending 30 minutes scrolling and requoting <laughs> 10 political things as an example, you know what I mean? Like, like seriously, like people always underestimate the influence that they can have in the world. Like you are gifted with this amazing talent. So use it wisely. Time is so short, right? Literally time is so short. You should use the, the lesson from your, your father having an accident, the lesson from your sister passing away to realize that it's not your choice, right? When you, when your time is up and that, like you were saying earlier on, it could be tomorrow, it could be today. So flip and don't waste your time doing things that are not meaningful. Waste, not yeah. use your time to use what like keeps that fire going, make a nice dent in the world, share good vibes and, um, that's going to really be what's sort of nutritious for your soul. This, it just happens. It just happened that way that a lot of the songs that I write always have to do with, with light, finding your way to the light. Um, the latest one, divine glow, living inside of the light. Because it really, are, we all like moths, all of us. Every single person is like a moth. Everybody gra gravitates towards the light, you know, and each one of us, we have something to offer other people. But it is like a freaking jungle out there. If you are not consciously, <laughs> um, purposefully using the tools available to you, like you're going to get distracted. I'm very easily distracted. It's actually, it's a pain. It's a massive pain for me. And I wish I was a lot better of just keeping focus. Um, but also there's grace for us as we are learning to get better um, in that, you know. So like, there, there's certain things around my household that I've kind of decided I'm not going to get angry if there are fingerprints on the kettle or on the oven. I'm not going to get angry if my son plays clay on the table and there are crumbs stuck in the clay. <laughs> I'm not going to get angry over this and I'm not going to get angry over that. Um, and it really is learning to juggle while walking on a balance beam with your eyes closed and having to also do something fulfilling for yourself while remembering to shave your legs and clip your own fingernails. And then somebody hands you a baby <laughs> and now you have to cook dinner and um, it becomes harder the more you have to focus on. But it's not impossible. And it, it just means you have to be, the word I was looking for earlier was intentional. Mm -hmm. It's like you have to become intentional with your time and with your words. Like you are getting older. When you were 20, you, are, you had, you know, if you live to a ripe old age to 80, you have 60 years of words. So you have some words that you can waste. You have some time to to go and waste but as your time gets less and less and less it's you know I think that's why midlife crises and these things exist because you realize I have not been intentional my time is you know so much time has passed what are the things that make me happy what are the things that used to make me happy um who am I as a person um running through those through those questions again you know because 
every single year that you are married or you have children, you then it's good. You know, you become a mishmash of personalities in a household, household and there are a lot of things that you put on the back burner, a lot, you know. Uh, you are, I'm a person that I'm not a very loud when I'm happy. I'm very loud when I'm angry. Um, but that is something that I have to, we always joke, we say you're like Af- Afrikaans Italian. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm Afrikaans Italian. But it's, you know, certain aspects of your personality you have to put on the back burner because they're just not important for right now. And because your capacity is only that one glass and that's what you have for the day, if there's too much of your own stuff in the glass, your capacity for your children shrink. So you have to take your own stuff, push it way down, make your capacity for your children and your family bigger, and then you do sometimes feel like an empty husk of a person because you haven't done anything for yourself in such a long time. And then you're like, oh my gosh, um, you, you know, you, you start doubting yourself and start, start doubting, you know, you can't even remember who you were anymore. But that even that changes and it fluctuates month to month, year to year. It's not just the same, you know, like one day and, um, you mentioned fear that women live in. It's amazing that you read that book because it's not something that people talk about a lot. You just need to go look at the difference between female politicians and male politicians and the thing that the, the things that they talk about. You know, as a as a mother. There's nothing that can prepare you for the wave of fear that develops in your life now that you try to cover your children and keep them safe from people, from traffic, from the swingers too high. There's a bee in the garden. Um, he can choke on this, choke on that. Um, you know, even the sippy cup is dangerous because the flow is too strong and baby can choke on it. Every single thing is a threat everything so keeping your mind on track and being intentional when you have the time to do something that is important for you as a person and an individual is really hard it's extremely difficult but it is very important it's like it's really hard yeah it's very very hard and for my personality type I'm not extremely good at um, for example, marketing myself. That's something that I would love to be able to do, you know, be content creator. It's not my strong suit. Um, but it is something that I would that's something that I would love to improve on. Um, having this conversation with you, I think, is extremely fruitful, extremely fruitful for me um, going forward. Like I said, I'm still, excuse me, finding my feet musically because I'm not pushing out music I'm not creating as much music as I would love to be to be able to put out there so my mind I'm kind of not creating music right now so it's not something I'm going to be I'm going to be talking about but if you are going to have an actual page on a site you are branded as an individual brand yourself like you have a really cool hat. I love your logo. I think it is so cool. Thank you. Yeah, but I mean, staying true to your to your brand, and I think we can all agree, cheapers. There's so many writers and actors and people who've actually become activists instead of artists. And I know that they they do like to do the crossover of an artist activist or an. More recently, you'll have the activist activist journalist. <laughs> um, but I think it's it's because people think that the thing that they're busy with is not important enough. They need to branch out into the other more important thing. And it's not necessarily like that, hey? I mean, why can't your art be important enough on itself? I think you are asking some rhetorical questions yeah for yourself if I'm truly honest and and you kind of maybe maybe starting to understand understand that you know a bit deeper like okay cool this is uh this is maybe 
what I can sort of start putting out or focusing my energy on. Yeah, this is a learning moment for me. I'll speak a bit more about that just now. Um, just as we kind of like wind up quickly, I just want to find out what's the best way for people to get a hold of you um, if they want to get in touch and um, what are you most excited about for the future? My DMs on, on X is open. Um, I don't know. I can't remember now if my business card is still connected to my um, to my site. But I mean, if you pop, pop me a message, I'm very open to having conversations with anybody. Um, I check my um, my notifications. So I think mean, if you if you tag me in something, I'll probably respond. Just like you found out now, please don't insult me. It's something that's going to hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> but um no i'm very i'm very keen to put my music out there for people to listen and, you know if they want to um discuss and or i i very fairly re um, often have people sending me dms or or even emailing me um, which i really enjoy hearing from people i really enjoy it uh what am i excited about I am excited about moving into a a bit of a new season, having maybe a little bit more time as my as my little one grows up. I mean, like I even hate saying it. It's such a, a tug and pull the whole time. You know, your your kids are really little. They're so cute. They're so demanding, and it takes so much time. And you're so tired. And and I often catch myself saying like, oh, don't worry, they'll they'll grow up soon. And you think, oh, they're going to grow up soon. But she is now a year and a half today. So in a couple of months, she's going to be two. And um, the more stable she is on, you know, on her feet, you don't have to worry about her getting into the cupboards and falling off this and falling off that. Um, it's going to be a lot easier for me just to grab my grab my guitar and my laptop and you know while she plays to sit and, and work on um, on some things I'm already starting to feel myself coming out of that really sleep deprived slump it's like <laughs> this hill that you climb when they're little like this. you're just like you're constantly climbing and you're constantly tired and you just live off coffee but um it feels like I'm kind of gonna reach a plateau Fairly, fairly soon so I'm, I'm looking forward to be able to um to start creating again a friend of mine Jake Nolan he's in Northern California he's a epic musician and a producer he makes some like really awesome music he's also an ex Jake Nolan go look him up and um we're gonna work on some some cover songs together so I think that's gonna be really really fun to work on there's some songs that I wish that I'd written over the years um if you want to put a new spin on it that's super cool I'm really I'm really excited for you um and my last question is um what does being ridiculously human mean to you it brings up a memory um of watching something with my husband one day and I I looked at him and I said to him you know like, I'm so done pretending because you know what pretending does to a person pretending means you're never gonna change for real you're never gonna really change anything and I said to him I'm making a decision now to live to let all the good bad and the ugly out from my mouth it's just gonna start flowing <laughs> I'm gonna stop pretending to be a nice person and it's going to stop because as I as I just live authentically and I'm constantly changing I want the good to flow from me authentically and being ridiculously human is like allowing other people to see all of you not just the bits that you want them to see because you're trying to save face or you're trying to portray something. And I think in many ways, this is maybe a longer answer than you, than you asked for, but the reason why you had to scroll through my feed and see so many random <laughs> things that has nothing to do with music and stuff, it's just like I was practicing putting my 
opinion out into the world. Because I didn't grow up really having a, an opinion about anything. I didn't know anything about politics or I didn't know what my stance was on this or what is my view on that. What do I really believe? And practicing putting it out there and getting a response back from people has taught me so much. You know, so it's like, it's, it's scary. It was so scary. I remember posting stuff and then immediately deleting it and then posting it again. And then someone comments something negative and then you delete it immediately. And you're just like, oh, I'm such a coward. <laughs> but it's really, you know, to be ridiculously human. So just to putting your authentic self your authentic self, like you also mentioned before, people want to see it and they, they gravitate towards people that that can show their humanity. And to also be awake to how your humanity is is being stolen from you, you know, for you to to conform. I don't know exactly. Maybe I need to to think about this a little a little bit more, but um Maybe you can cut that last bit out. No, not at all. I think your answer was great. And this is, you know, this is what, what it is. You know, I think kind of like thinking in, in real time. And and it's actually nice that you That's a good answer. almost say that because something that that is, I guess, sort of come out of this conversation for me about you is that your understanding about life and your and your depth of that understanding is very deep and connecting, right? And I think that you will open up huge channels by expressing this side of you. So now you've learned, you've gone through the process, right? You've gone through the process of like expressing yourself, finding the confidence to put your thoughts out there. Uh, finding your voice, you know, you, you go, you've gone through that and you've used, say, um, one aspect of you, which is the, the sort of side that is maybe not truly, truly you, which is like just sort of focusing a bit on, say, like politics and world events and these sort of things. Life is always an evolution, right? Um, we're constantly evolving. We're constantly trying to get better. Uh, and our lives are constantly changing. We're constantly changing. Um, and your path is like, okay, cool. Well, maybe the next step is now for me to start expressing more deeply about who I am, um, <clears throat> about the challenges that I face, about um, trying to grow my circle by sharing my, my true authentic self. And I think you must express that more and you will... Um, be so surprised by how that is received like truly you have a lot to offer um and you must uh find that that like little fire and, and carry it carry it going that 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 self belief and understand that you 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 put on this planet to um share your uniqueness right like that's why we're all here. Like, let's all share our uniqueness because the world needs all of that for all of us and from all of us. So I just want to say thanks for the conversation. Um, you've been very open and honest and it's, it's felt like a, a really cool conversation. And um, this is the sort of stuff that I think people want to hear you know, and can relate to. That's the most, that's, that's one of the most important things is like, make yourself relatable. You know, I'm the, I'm the mom singer. I'm the, 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 the singer, the, the mom trying to be a singer, you know, this may be, you know what I mean? Like maybe that's the handle. Ava in Africa is awesome, but the mom trying to be the singer or some, I don't know, you know what I mean? Just like this, maybe that's just your, your, your kind of mantra to, to help you decide. Um, how to express yourself. So anyway, I just wanted to say a massive thanks for coming on the podcast. It's, it's always cool chatting to South Africans. There's, there's something always like for me, it's great, you know, 
and um, I just wish you all the best and everything. And you have a, you have a fantastic voice, and um, your songs are very deep and nourishing, and and just all the best with uh, with what you have coming up. Oh, thank you so much, Gareth. You really have a gift of a uh, really like pulling on a golden strand to get something out of a person. It's really awesome to to be a part of. Thank you so much. I didn't know what to expect. Um, I've done some some radio interviews recently, and they're just it's just awful because they run through the same type of questions. And I found that you know, I didn't really think about that very much, or I didn't give a good answer. But now we on to the next question, and and you know, feels like I fumbled through it, but. Um, yeah, this is a very nice conversation. I'd love to have more of a conversation with you to uh, to also hear about your story because you have such an interesting story, I'm sure. But Definitely. yeah, I mean, you, we you we rub shoulders with people on on social media, like where we met on X, and because you know it's in type form and in short form, you don't really get to the deep stuff of a person. And it's, um, it really is a, like you mentioned before as well, you mentioned the word responsibility. And it is so important. You know, when you, when you work with words, you also work with words. I work with words in my songwriting. Words have such, it carries such a responsibility. And I think it's something that we easily miss because you're just giving an opinion. It's just, just quickly like a jab. Like, oh, you suck. <laughs> Um, but we do, we are torch carriers, you know, of our own, of our own gifts and actually how responsible are we for the, for the giftings in, in other people, you know, like, are we, are we going to also take up responsibility for the gifts in, in others so that you can see them thrive and see what they can do with, you know, for them. So like our words can pull that beautiful magic out of a person or it can <laughs> try, and, try and snuff that little ember. So, yeah, you're what totally are we, right. Yeah, what, are we, what are we choosing? Exactly. Cool. That's a great way to end. Thank you so much. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. 